Luigi, Luigi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hey, um, I have into Google Classroom because you download it and you upload it into the uh, stream where everybody can get it, which I don't want. And also, I have problem uh, downloaded uh, downloading the um, the one that the zip version. All right. So please just upload. You you need to upload it under your experiment one results assignment. All right, upload it there. And just that file will do. Don't upload anything else. Just the file that you have problem. All right, re-upload again. Huh? Ah, okay, miss. Ah, under assignment. Huh? Ah, okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to start with uh, chapter 6 today. So I need to rush a bit on your lecture so that you can uh, you are ready to do your practical session number two next week. Next week, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So let's start. Okay, this chapter six is about base 10 uh, digital communication. So uh, we have actually covered uh, the two important uh, analog communication system, which are amplitude modulation and uh, frequency modulation. Uh, sorry, miss, are you sharing your screen? I have one, uh, Alama. Sorry. Uh. Can you see? Yes, miss. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks for telling me. Okay. So um, we have covered uh, the two important analog communication system in the previous chapters, right? Uh, they are amplitude modulation uh, and frequency modulations. So the intermediate chapter or the transition into digital communication from analog communication is the uh, pulse modulation. All right, so we have covered that as well in chapter five. So in this chapter, we're going to look at uh, baseband digital communication. So uh, this chapter basically will cover four major topics. The first one is PCM. Second is line coding. The third one is DPCM, uh, ADPCM. And the fourth is the DM, ADM. All right, PCM stands for, um, what is PCM? House code modulation. You learn PCM, right, from your previous chapters. All right, then we'll learn, uh, then we're going to move on to uh, take a quick look at the uh, uh, differential PCM and also adaptive differential PCM, uh, followed by some uh, digital modulation and also adaptive, uh, oh no, delta modulation and also on the, uh, adaptive delta modulation. Okay, uh, there are four learning outcomes that you must fulfill in this chapter. First one is to explain the processes involved in PCM. All right, second one is to calculate the quantization noise, uh, signal to noise ratio, bit rates, and uh, transmission bandwidth of PCM signals. Uh, third one is to explain the purpose of line coding and various line coding formats. And the fourth one is to explain the concept of uh, DPCM, ADPCM, uh, DM, and ADM. Okay, this slide show you the uh, block diagram of a baseband digital communication system. All right, so uh, as far as uh, this uh, digital communication system is concerned, as the name digital suggests, the information that we're going to transmit has to be digital. All right, so if your source or the information you want to transmit is not in digital format, then uh, you have to do the necessary conversion first. All right. So, for example, if your source information is text, all right, it's uh, let's say a page of uh, text info, then you have to convert the text into uh, the bit form first. All right, so basically, um, the common way of uh, trans of converting texture info into binary info is by um, ASCII code, isn't it? So that is the process of encoding. All right, you may also want to use other form of uh, coding. 
Um, then if your source or your message is in analog form, then you have to perform uh, analog to digital conversion. All right. So the uh, three basic or three fundamental process involved in analog to digital conversions are sampling, quantization, quantizing, as well as encoding. All right. You could convert your analog information into binary information or what we call uh, digital information. All right, and then uh, this, this series of uh, binary information will then be uh, pulse modulated right? and the pulses will be uh, transmitted over the channel. Yeah, and at the receiver, the receiver need to detect the pulses. All right, and then convert it to, again, uh, back into bit strings. Yeah, binary info. And uh, if the um, receiver is to receive the digital info as it is, then, um, whatever come out from your demodulator is your information. All right. But if you were the destination were to receive texture info, then you have to convert the uh, digital info into uh, text again by decoding. Yeah. Uh, then depend on what kind of encoding method you use over here, then you have to use a corresponding uh, decoding process here. Yeah. And if your signal is uh, analog form, all right, and you want to recover the analog form, then you have to pass the signal through a low pass filter. The decoded signal pass it through a low pass filter and that will give you your analog information back. Okay, this slide basically show you a more detailed um, block diagram. So in this case, um, this, this source, um, the conversion for the source um, has been uh, simplified to just ADC in case you need to convert your source from analog to digital. And then um, for as far as the pulse uh, modulation is concerned, it involves two process. One is called uh, line coding. All right. And uh, what happened actually in line coding? So now, um, if um, for for the digital information that you want to transmit, of course, the digital info, um, as we know it, is normally in binary format, right? It's 1011, one, one, for example. And then line coding basically um, convert, right, convert the uh, this binary stream all right, into some electrical signal. All right, and uh, we normally use, uh, let's say, this, this is 1011. One, one. If we use a rectangular uh, wave or rectangular signal, then uh, one will be, let's say, a positive pulse, rectangular pulse. Zero will be uh, you know, negative or zero voltage. And then a one, one, maybe again, another um, positive pulse. All right. Um, and then this rectangular pulse, right? Um, as we know it, rectangular pulse in time domain will have a very wide or infinite bandwidth in frequency domain. All right, so um, for our channel with limited bandwidth, we can't really transmit the signal as it is. All right, so we have to uh, shape our pulse first before we transmit. So the pulse shaping process basically convert this uh, rectangular pulse into a pulse that is uh, going to take up less bandwidth. All right but still represent the binary information that we are sending, All right? So a uh, common one is uh, a new edit, All right? So the power shaping will convert the rectangular wave into more sinusoidal look. Then um, transmitting through the channel. So for baseband uh, digital communication, the channel normally is a wire, All right? It could be a cable as well. So you can't really transmit a baseband digital signal or waveform like this uh, over uh, free space. Yeah? You, may, you must make use of a wire or a cable. So again, wire and cable normally have a limited bandwidth. Uh, and then that is going to uh, have some filtering effect on your signal as well. Yeah? And then with some attenuation over the wire, you know, by the time it reaches the receiver, all right, your signal may look uh, may have noise riding over it and then it may be attenuated all right and then it may look like this okay so the receiver uh, again is going to have a filter to actually filter out the noise mainly the high frequency noise okay and this is followed by a sampling process all right Sampling process means uh, the receiver have to read the uh, information coming in at the right time. Yeah. 
So sampling process, uh, definitely, uh, definitely uh, you have to choose the right sampling point. For example, we sample here. All right, we sample here, we sample here, we sample here. All right, and then uh, this is followed by a thresholder. All right, thresholder basically is the circuit to decide, you know, whether the, the voltage of the signal at this point, all right, it, does it represent a one or does it represent a zero? Okay, so if you actually sample at the right time, then you should be able to recover the one zero one one uh, bit information. Okay, and then uh, if your destination is supposed to receive uh, analog, then this digital stream is then converted into analog format. Yeah. So that is a short description on the uh, baseband digital data communication system. So in this chapter, we're going to look into, uh, we're going to take a quick look at the ADC process. All right, I believe you've learned this, so I just uh, quickly run through it. And then uh, we're going to spend more time looking at the line coding process, right, as well as the power shaping process. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a quick one on uh, PCM. PCM basically is the ADC process, uh, the analog to digital converter. It's not so much of a modulation, it's more of a conversion. All right. So if you are using an analog signal and then you want to transmit an analog signal through a digital uh, channel, then definitely you have to first convert your analog signal into digital format. Yeah. So there are three steps. Uh, you need to first sample the message signal and uh, make sure you sample the signal above Nyquist frequency. Yeah. yeah this is um, based on the sampling theory that we have studied before. So if you look at the diagram at the bottom, all right, we have an analog signal here. <laughs> Continuous in time, continuous in amplitude. All right. So after perform the sampling, so basically the sampling process will give us a series of PAM signals. All right. So these PAM signals are discrete in time, but continuous in amplitude. All right. So um, continuous in amplitude. Um, that means we still cannot uh, use a binary or binary data to represent. We have to uh, we have to first quantize the signal first. So quantize the signal meaning we limit the amplitude to a few discrete levels. All right. So that is the quantization process. So the output of a quantization process will produce a, a sets of uh, quantized signals. So this quantized signal basically will have a uh, uh, will be discrete in time and also discrete in amplitude. All right. Uh, then this is followed by the encoding process. All right, so the encoding process will actually convert the discrete amplitude into binary code word. All right, so that means this amplitude, what is the binary representation? And this amplitude will have its own binary representation as well. Yeah, so, um, so at the output of the encoding process, you will have a streams of digital data, which is a bit streams of ones and zeros. All right, so uh, let's take a look at the uh, signal in time domain as well as in frequency domain uh, during the sampling process. All right, so we have uh, uh, analog data in time domain, it's called XT, and this data has a, a frequency spectrum of uh, XF in frequency domain. Yeah. So when we perform sampling in time domain, we are basically uh, multiplying the signal XD with a series of impulses over here. All right, that will produce a PAM signal uh, with its pulse height or pulse amplitude um, corresponding to the amplitude of the uh, message or the analog signal that we are uh, sampling. Yeah, And in the frequency domain, all right, this will actually uh, create replica replica of the, uh, the frequency spectrum, the baseband frequency spectrum uh, or over uh, various FS, all right? FS, 2FS, 3FS, and so on. Uh, also, do you have one, uh, you have one set of uh, spectrum at the baseband as well. Yeah, so this is what happened uh, during the sampling process. So uh, again, um, when you perform sampling, make sure the sampling frequency must be high enough 
all right, must be high enough again to avoid uh, aliasing effect. All right, so we have looked at the effect of not uh, using a frequency that is high enough, then you're going to have your spectrum overlap over here. All right, so when you have your spectrum overlap, then that means the signal that will recover will not be the exact uh, version of the signal that we transmit. All right, basically, you're going to have a distorted signal here at this region. Okay, so um, if you have your sampling frequency greater than uh, two times the highest frequency in your baseband signal, then you have enough gap right, uh, between uh, the different um, replica of your spectrum. And then you then, then that allow you to actually use a low pass filter to recover your baseband signal later on. Okay, so when you perform sampling, uh, again, um, the sampling theorem say, yeah, um, a band limited signal with no spectral components beyond FM, that means the highest frequency you have in that signal is FM. Uh, M in here stands for maximum frequency. Yeah? Um, so you can actually uniquely determine by value sample a uniform interval of TS, right? And then we normally put FS, which is the sampling frequency. So your sampling frequency must be uh, at least two times the highest frequency in your uh, baseband signal. And um, of course, this sampling rate is called, the minimum is called Nyquist rate. Now. Yeah. But uh, a lot of time we actually sample at more than uh, Nyquist rate. Okay. On the quantization process, uh, during the quantization process, the sampled value are quantized. So what is meant by quantized? Quantized means the amplitude uh, of the sampled signal is actually rounded off right, to a number of uh, a fixed number of uh, values, okay, and or a finite number of values. Yeah. So that will give us a discrete time and discrete amplitude signal. All right. So if the input is continuous, your output is uh, will be a staircase uh, signal step. All right. So as far as uh, quantization is, is concerned. The output, the output value, the output amplitude can only have a fixed value, a certain value, right? You cannot have a continuous amplitude. Okay, um, so just a quick revision on your quantization process. Okay, there are a few uh, terms that you need to know about quantization process. The first one is the quantization level, all right? Quantization level L, we normally call it L, is uh, equals to 2 to the power of n. And what is n? n is the number of binary bits that we use to represent each sample. All right. And for example, if we use three bit, okay, we use three binary bits to represent the amplitude of the sample, the number of uh, quantization level we have, L is equals to 2 to the power of 3, which is 8. All right. So in this case, our first level, you know, uh, level zero is uh, represented by this three bit binary word, uh, zero, zero, zero. All right, the highest level is uh, one, 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 uh, yeah. Okay, that is the first thing about quantization level. The second thing is, uh, the second term uh, during quantization process uh, is the quantization interval, All right? Quantization interval, uh, we normally use delta V. All right, that this quantization interval will actually tell you the voltage difference between two adjacent quantized level. All right, so um, it can be found by taking the peak to peak voltage, all right, uh, divide, by, divide by the uh, quantized number of quantization level, which is L. Yeah. And here I have give you an example. We have a simple signal that has five volt amplitude. So that means the peak to peak voltage is uh, 10 volt. And uh, okay, because we are using a three bit binary word here. So we have our L, which is eight level. Yeah. So that means the quantization interval or the voltage difference between two adjacent quantized level is uh, 10 divided by eight. All right, so that is 1.25 volt. All right, and why we need to know the quantization interval? Quantization interval uh, is to actually help us to, to know the quantization error. All right, 
quantization error is the difference between the actual analog value and the quantized digital value. All right, remember during quantization process, we actually round off our amplitude, right? Round off our amplitude to a certain values. So the difference between the actual value and the round off value is the error. All right. And um, the maximum quantization error basically is the half of the uh, minimum step size or what we call the quantization interval. All right, that is uh, delta V over two. All right, then uh, for encoding, the encoding process will convert the quantized level into binary code word. All right, and uh, again, uh, depending on how many level you use to quantize the signal, all right, the n basically is given by uh, log 2L. All right, again, this comes from L equals to 2 to the power of n. So in this uh, slide, I have an examples of a few sample signals. Okay, and then these sample signals are to be quantized to eight levels. All right, starting from level zero all the way to level seven. Yeah, and then the peak to peak, peak to peak uh, voltage of this sample signal is from minus five to plus five. All right, so if I were to divide it into eight different levels, right, that means uh, I have this, uh, I can actually split the voltages uh, into eight different levels that allow me to uh, round, off, round off the amplitude to the nearest value. Okay, take the first pulse for example. The first pulse, the amplitude is 1.9 volt. All right, and the nearest value to 1.9 volt, all right, is uh, 1.875, all right. So 1.875 uh, basically correspond to level five, which is a binary code of uh, uh, 101. Yeah. And therefore uh, a sample, a sample pulse or a pulse with a PAM pulse with the amplitude of 1.9 uh, volt is represented by a binary code word of 101. Okay. Uh, so if you look at the next pulse, the next pulse has amplitude of 4.3 volt. All right, 4.3 volt. So the nearest level is uh, 4.375 volt, which corresponds to um, binary code word of 111. All right, so therefore this, the amplitude of this pulse uh, is represented by a binary bit uh, values of 111. All right. Right, so this slide show you the uh, error generated by quantization. Okay, so um, the continuous dotted line are actually your input wave. All right, and then the staircase um, waveform is your quantizer output. All right, so you can see that um, when we actually convert, all right, convert the, uh, we quantize our amplitude, the amplitude of this value, this value here, look at the dotted line here, uh, will be quantized to uh, this value over here. This is the steps. All right. So you can see there is a difference. The difference between uh, this step here and the actual um, input amplitude or the input uh, voltage is actually the error. So you can see now we have an error here, a positive error. All right. Um, or oh, negative error in this case. Um, then if you take a look again at maybe the next one, okay, at this, this is the voltage of the input uh, wave, but then it's quantized into this level. All right, again, the difference is your error. Yeah. So the biggest error you ever have again is delta V over two, lah, right? Your step size is delta V. So the biggest error you can have is delta V over two because you always uh, quantize to the nearest level, All right? So it can be a higher level, it can be a lower level, depending on where the voltage of the input wave is. Is it closer to the higher level or is it closer to the lower level? Okay, so um, the difference, all right? The difference between the, the magnitude of your input wave and the quantizer output is called the uh, quantization noise, all right? 
is also called the quantization error as well. Yeah. So this error actually give rise to your noise. Yeah. So it's like noise has been added to your original signal. Okay, if your if your input signal has voltage range that is wider than the quantization range, then you must make sure you normalize the input signal before quantization. All right. So in this example, in this example, uh, my quantizer my quantizer basically will produce a up, uh, we have an output you can handle actually from minus four to plus four. All right. But my signal voltages or the sample signal actually has an amplitude. Um, the highest is 19.9 .9 at this point, but it's possible that it gave me it may be higher. All right. So in this case, uh, we're gonna take um the input input voltage range from plus 20 to minus 20. All right, so this will be plus 20 and the lowest is actually minus 20. All right, so when we, um, before we actually quantize it, we must normalize it. So they actually correspond to the normalized amplitude of uh, plus four and minus four. All right, so how do we normalize it? So we normalize it by uh, taking the range of the um, original data, okay, and also the range of the normalized data. Yeah. So the output of the normalization process, I call it yi, right, is equal to the data that you want to normalize, xi, right, divided by the range of the um, original data, right, and then multiply with the uh, range of the normalized data. So they will give you your yi. Yeah, so take one, let's take one for example here. Let's say this 7.5, this pulse at 7.5 volt. All right, 7.5, um, if I were to normalize it, that will be 7.5 divided by, okay, my range is uh, max to mean is actually what, plus 40, plus 20 minus 20, that would give me 40, right? So I multiply by uh, plus 4 minus 4 is actually 8, isn't it? All right, so that will give me 1.5 divided by 40 times 8. All right, so that will give me 1.5 volt. So that's how this 1.5 come about. All right, and then uh, what is the quantized value of this uh, 1.5? All right, so again, if we were to divide, uh, in this case, again, we have eight levels. All right, eight levels. And uh, this uh, 1.5 volt basically correspond to uh, level five. All right, level five. Um, then that will give us the okay, that will give us a binary code of 101. Okay, and what are the error? No error, isn't it? Because 1.5, I quantize to 1.5, therefore no error. The error is zero. Okay. And uh, let's take another example. Here, let's say I have a 19.7. My original PM signal has an amplitude of 19.7. And uh, I then normalize it to 3.94. All right. And then the nearest, the nearest quantized value I can use is 3.5. All right. So this, this will give me a quantization error of uh, minus 0 0.44. Minus 0 0.44 basically is the normalized BM value minus the quantized value, that will be minus 0 0.44. All right, that means my, the normalized value is uh, 0 0.44 less than the actual value. Okay, and then 3.5 basically correspond to uh, level seven here. All right, level seven, um, that means uh, the binary representation of bind for level seven is 111. Okay, so a sample signal with the amplitude of 19.7 is now represented by a binary stream of 111. Yeah. That's on uh, normalization. Okay, so in practice, in practice, the quantization uh, process um, can be done. Uh, it's actually done depending on your input signal um, bandwidth, all right? 
So in this example here, <coughs> we have, uh, let's say for compact this CD, all right, audio signal normally is sampled at uh, 44 kilohertz and quantized to with a 16-bit binary word. And that means uh, N equals to, this is your N, so N equals to 16. So that means uh, this, this set of audio signal can be represented by any one of the 65536 uh, possible values. All right. Then of course, uh, uh, if you use more levels or more binary bits, then uh, the, the better our approximation is, and then uh, the lower the quantization error is. Okay. Um, but of course, if you increase more level, meaning you increase your N, all right, you are going to increase the bandwidth as well. We're going to look at the bandwidth uh, later on here. Um, let's talk a bit more about quantization process. Um, there are actually two types of uh, quantization in uh, being done in practice. Uh, the first one is called uniform quantization, and the second one is called uh, non-uniform quantization. So for uniform quantization, all right, for uniform quantization, um, the quantization process basically has a fixed quantization interval. That means the delta V is fixed for the entire signal range. Yeah. So this example, we have uh, N equals to four. <coughs> that gives us a quantization level of 16. <coughs> and let's say my signal um, amplitude is from plus uh, five to minus five. That will give us a quantization interval of uh, 10 divided by 16, which is 0 0.625 volt. All right. So that means uh, regardless of whether the signal is uh, negative, you know, two or plus three or plus five, uh, the condensation interval is fixed at 0 0.065. Yeah. And uh, this type of condenser is good when your input is uniformly distributed. That means your input signal has uh, amplitudes uh, uh, from minus five to plus five <coughs> and evenly distributed over time. Yeah. Um, however, however, a lot of real life signals uh, are actually not uniformly distributed and we have a lot of uh, small signal amplitudes as compared to large signal amplitude. All right. Uh, so therefore, most of the time, most of the time, the signal does not use the entire range of your quantization level. All right. Uh, which is available with equal probabilities. So most of the time, we actually use the uh, quantization level, uh, which at the lower amplitude, all right? With uh, maybe a few occasion, we actually quantize at high amplitude. So because of this, all right, uh, small uh, signal with small amplitude are not represented well, yeah? And then because of this, they are actually more uh, susceptible to quantization noise, all right? So um, the, Diagram on the right hand side here basically show you the difference between the uniform uh, quantization process and the non-uniform quantization process. All right, so the for uniform quantization, you can see that the delta v here, this is your delta v, the step size is the same. All right, regardless whether your signal amplitude is small over here or your signal amplitude is big. But for non-uniform quantization. All right, because uh, we want to represent the signal with small amplitude or more accurately. So we normally use a smaller uh, quantization interval here at the for signal with small amplitude. As compared to, uh, let's say, signal with high amplitude, we use a bigger quantization interval. All right. So um, that is what is normally done for non-uniform quantization, right? So that we can represent the small amplitude signal better, yeah? Okay, so this slide show you the comparison between a uniform and non-uniform quantization. All right, the left-hand side is on the uniform quantization. The right-hand side is on non-uniform quantization. Uh, we have the same signal here. Uh, we have two types of signal. All right, uh, the strong signal is this one. This is your strong signal. All right, so for strong signal, oops.
All right, so for strong signal, you can see that the representation um, of the, the quantized signals um, is pretty good because uh, they, they are using the same quantization uh, interval. Right, so the quantized signal basically represents the strong signal quite well. But if you were to look at the weak signal, all right, the weak signal is this one over here. Yeah, so based on weak, you look at the weak signal, this weak signal is only represented by two different uh, uh, quantized levels. Yeah? Only represented two by two levels. Yeah, in the uniform uh, quantizer. But if you were to use a non-uniform quantizer, all right, you can see that the weak signal, the weak signal actually are represented by more levels. Yeah, because uh, we actually use a smaller uh, interval uh, at a smaller amplitude. Um, however, if you look at the strong signal, strong signal actually when we use non-uniform quantizer, all right, um, we actually don't lose much. All right, we still can represent the strong signal quite well. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, how to actually design a non-uniform quantizer? Non-uniform quantizer actually are not easy to design because uh, you need to know, you need to know uh, the statistic of the source information first. All right, you need to know the range, the range of your signal amplitude. And you also need to know uh, the frequency or the probability of the small signal as compared to a, a high level signal. Okay, and um, therefore you may need different quantizer for different input types. Yeah, um, there's a solution to this. All right, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to transfer input signal into one that look uniform, and then we use uniform quantizer. All right. And this solution is called a uh, compending. All right, a compending process. Uh, this compending, this word compending, comes from the word uh, two words, which is compress. The come from compress, and the pen comes from the expand. All right. So basically, what we do is uh, we compress the signal at transmitter, and then later we expand it at the receiver. Right, and of course, uh, with this uh, compending process, we can improve the dynamic range of our uh, signal representation. Yeah. Um, so a typical example is for speech signal. Speech signal normally has high amplitude, uh, high probability for low amplitudes. So therefore, we compress the large amplitude signal before we actually perform uh, uniform quantization. <laughs> Okay, so uh, they are this compending process basically involves four steps. So the first step is to compress the signal first. Yeah, we compress the input signal, and then uh, it, we convert the signal into digital form, and then we quantize it. Right, in the A to D converter, we use a quantizer that is uniform. All right, then we transmit the quantized signal as it is. Uh, so at the receiver, we have to convert the signal from digital back to analog, isn't it? Right, then after that, we actually expand the signal. All right, expand the signal to actually get the original form. So that's what the uh, compending process is about. Okay, uh, this slide show you the compending laws. So as far as the international telecommunication standards is concerned, all right, there are two compression laws, all right, that has been accepted. Yeah, and uh, the, these are called the new law or micro law, depending on how you pronounce this symbol. <laughs> okay, and this law is normally used in uh, North America and Japan. Yeah, and then we have an A law. A law is normally used in Europe and uh, the rest of the world and also the internal international routes. Yeah. And uh, what is mu law? So as far as mu law or the micro law is concerned, right, the signal fx, okay, the compended signal is can be can be found by or can be um, 
can be gained or determined using this equation. All right, so um, X is our input signal over here. All right, multiply with the factor mu, yeah, and then plus one, and then the, take the natural logarithm of it. And this is divided by a natural logarithm of one plus mu. All right, and then the here we put the sign of X. So let's say your signal is a positive signal. So the sign is a plus. If a negative signal, then the sign is a minus. All right. And uh, you have to make sure that your x is normalized between uh, minus one to plus one before you uh, perform the compression. Okay. And then for recovery, <coughs> recovery, then uh, you have to actually follow this equation. The recovery process will follow this equation. Uh, basically, the whatever that you have uh, compressed, um, right? You you have to take the uh, one plus again. You use the same same value that you use in the compression. So for expansion, you use the same mu value here, and uh, one plus mu to the power of uh, magnitude of y. <coughs> All right. Uh, y again, we take the absolute value of y. What is y? Y is the signal that actually you receive. Uh, um. Then minus one divided by the mu. All right, again, the sign, the sign of y will actually follow the sign of the um, y that you receive. So if y is positive, then this sign is a positive. Y is negative, then sign is the negative. All right, again, <clears throat> when you perform your expansion, you have to make sure your y uh, amplitude or your signal level is normalized to plus one and minus one. Okay, so what is the Standard values for you know mu or micro in this case is two five five. Okay, normally use is two five five. If you were to follow this uh, standard CCITT G seven one one standard. Okay, and for A law, A law use a slightly different equation. Yeah, again, uh, the sign is the same. You have to follow the sign of the input signal. Okay, and then you have to multiply the amplitude of your input signal or the magnitude. We just take the magnitude of your input signal, multiply with the factor A. All right. Again, you have to normalize such that the amplitude of X is less than 1 over A. All right. This is for X less than 1 over A. Um, this equation is for X less than 1 over A. But if your the magnitude of X is somewhere between uh, 1 over A and 1, all right, then uh, you have to use a second set of equation. All right, and in A law, um, if you were to use again the CCITT G711 standards, the value for A is 87.6. All right, that's for compression. And for expansion, uh, again, depending on the incoming signal Y, right, if the magnitude of Y is less than this, then you have to use this equation at the top. But if the magnitude of y is between this range, right, make sure you normalize your y as well yeah, before you actually perform your expansion. So if the magnitude of y is between this range, then you follow the equation at the bottom. All right, and again, because in during compression, uh, the value of a of 87.6 is used, so during expansion, uh, you have to use the same value for A as well, which is 87.6. Okay, if you follow this standard, right, CCITTG711 standard. Okay, this slide should show you the comparison between the, uh, the micro law and the A law. All right, and this is for different uh, values for your micro or mu. So now, um, with no compression, okay. Um, if you don't have any compression, that means your mu is zero. All right, so linear. The output will actually follow what the input is. Yeah, but if you were to compress using different uh, factor, then you can see that your curve basically um, will follow, will actually change. All right, so the highest value for your uh, mu basically is 255 over here. Okay, so that's for the biggest uh, compression uh, factor. And for 
A law, if you were to use A law, again, uh, if no compression, meaning your A is one. All right. And the maximum compression is when A is 100. You can see the shape of the curve uh, for A equals to 100 and uh, mu equals to 455 are pretty much the same. Uh. They are actually quite close to each other. Okay, so uh, this slide show you uh, the curve all right, of the signal during the compression as well as the expansion process. All right, so compression is normally done at the transmitter. All right, so this is when the high amplitude signal basically are compressed to uh, lower amplitude values. Yeah, and then at the receiver where the signal is to be expanded, then um, the lower value of uh, amplitude now will be uh, expanded to a higher value amplitude at the output. All right, so maybe you just reverse the process. Okay, let's talk about noise. All right, so in communication system, we, we always need to consider the noise factor. All right, so as far as the PCM is concerned, major source of noise actually come from quantization process. All right, and uh, as I mentioned previously, this noise is caused by the error uh, made during the quantization uh, process. So as far as uniform quantization is concerned, right, the quantization error is evenly distributed, right, because we use the same quantization interval, all right, from small signal all the way up to big signal. And the RMS value for quantization noise is given by this equation over here. All right, so the RMS value for the noise voltage is equals to delta V over root 12. All right, delta V, what is delta V? Delta V is our quantization interval. All right, uh, then divide by the factor of root 12. Uh, I will not go into the details on how this uh, expression is being obtained. If you're interested, then you can always read the reference book. Yeah? Uh, this gives us the uh, signal to quantization noise ratio, I call it SQNR, all right, being the RMS signal power over the RMS noise power. Okay, so the RMS signal power uh, can be found by using uh, VP over root 2 square. All right, VP over root 2 square, whereas the RMS noise power uh, we substitute in this expression in uh, there is delta v over root 12 uh, square. All right, so that will give us the um, signal to quantization uh, noise ratio. Normally, for uh, signal to noise ratio, we use power. Yeah, yeah, we always take the ratio of the two power signal power over the noise power. So, um, if I were to substitute delta v. All right, with the uh, expression VPP over L by definition, right? And uh, what is L? L is two to the power of N, isn't it? And VPP, I can replace it with two VP. All right, peak to peak voltage basically is two times the peak voltage, isn't it? So there is two VP. So if I were to substitute this in uh, into the equation for delta V, then I'll, I will arrive at uh, this expression here at the bottom, which is SQNR equals to 2 to the power n root 6 over 2 uh, squared. All right. And if I were to express it in dB, okay, uh, SQNR is normally expressed in decibel. So that will give me uh, 6.02 n plus 1.76 dB. All right. In dB, that means I have to take 10 log. Uh, 10 log of, uh, because it's power, right? So I just 10 log it. So that will give me this. Okay, so what does this tell us? All right, what does this tell us? Okay, before that, what is N? N, as you recall, is the number of bits that you use to represent each sample. Yeah. Um, so from this expression, if you were to, um, if I were to, add number of bits into each sample, All right? For every bit that I add over here, I will gain uh, 6 dB in my 
uh, signal to quantization noise ratio. Yeah, if I were to add one bit, right, instead of using three bit, now I use four bit. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to gain uh, 6 dB. All right, I'm going to gain 6 dB in my SQNMR. And of course, this is not surprise because the more bit you add, all right, whenever you add one more bit, then you're going to add the um, number of uh, quantization level. Your L will increase because L is equal to 2 to the power of N, right? So the more, if I were to, oops, if I were to add, uh, if I were to add um, more bits, that means I have to think I'm going to increase the number of uh, level, all right, because L is 2 to the power of N, right? And then I'm going to reduce the delta V, isn't it? Because delta V is what? Delta V is equal to 2 VP over L, right? So if I increase my L, my delta V will reduce, right? I increase N, my L will increase. With the increase in L, I'm going to have a reduction in delta V. And then the error, error is called delta V over 2, isn't it? So I reduce delta V, that means my error will reduce as well. Okay, so that means uh, if you were to put the numbers in, every time I add one bit, delta V will be reduced by a factor of two. All right, noise power will then be reduced by a factor of four. Why factor of four? Because power is voltage square, right? Yeah, so square of two will give you four. So a factor of four basically is equivalent to six dB, sorry. Right, a factor of four is equivalent, equivalent to six dB gain. Uh, six dB reduction in noise power, meaning I'm gonna have a gain, I'm gonna gain six dB uh, in my signal to uh, noise ratio. All right, that is for uniform uh, quantizer. If you're if you are using a non-uniform quantizer, then your uh, signal to quantization noise in dB basically the same is the same factor over here with 6.0 to n, but uh, the second factor which is 1.76 for uniform now is to be replaced with a factor called alpha. Okay, what is alpha? Alpha depends on which law you use uh, for your non-uniform quantization process. Right? If you use the the micro law or the mu law, then alpha is equal to 4.77 minus 20 log. This. All right. If you use A law, then alpha is again 4.77 minus this expression. Okay, depend on which law you use. Okay, are you still with me? Ah? One hour already. So I think uh, it's a good time to take a break. Uh, you have any questions before we start for a break? No question. Yeah, this, this part is nothing new. Uh. You have learned this before in other courses. So that's why I run through it quickly. All right, let's take a short break and then we shall resume uh, after the break.
Okay, shall we continue? Yes, miss. All right, so let's. Okay, you can you see my screen, right? Yes, miss. Okay, so we have moved to the uh, more important part of this chapter which is the bit rate and bandwidth requirements of PCM, all right? So as far as the uh, communication system is concerned, remember the two resources that we are, we, we must always consider when we uh, construct a communication system. The two important resources are bandwidth as well as your signal power, right? Yeah. So uh, let's look at the bandwidth. <clears throat> bandwidth is related to uh, our bit rate. So now, um, what is the bit rate of a PCM signal? All right, in P the bit rate of a PCM signal can be calculated using uh, uh, this equation here. All right, bit rate is equals to the number of bits per sample multiplied by the sampling rate. So where does it come from? So take for example, let's say I, uh, I use three bit to represent my, my each sample. All right, three bit is used to represent each sample. And then I, sam I, I have a sampling rate of, let's say, um, uh, 10 samples per second. All right. So that will give me a bit rate of uh, 30 bits per second. All right. 30 bits per second. Yeah. Um, so the bandwidth required to transmit this signal actually depend on the type of line, line coding used. Uh, this is the one I'm, I'm going to talk about after this. Yeah. Um, and you can also see that uh, as far as a digitized signal is concerned, all right, to transmit a digitized signal, we always need more bandwidth than the an original analog signal. All right. Um, then, of course, we pay a price. Uh, for this price, the, on the bandwidth requirement, we pay for more bandwidth, but we actually get uh, other benefits. Yeah, One of them is the robustness of uh, digital information as compared to uh, analog information. When we transmit the signal in a digital form, it's more robust to noise. All right, so it's, it's more, or shall we say more immune to noise as compared to analog signal. Analog signal, as we have seen, okay, are actually very uh, sensitive to noise. Yeah. But if we digitize the signal and we transmit it in a digital form, you will see that uh, actually digital signals are less immune to, are less uh, susceptible to noise, right, as compared to analog signal. But we pay a price by using more bandwidth. Okay. Um, yes. Look at that one example here. Uh, this example, we want to digitize the human voice. What is the bit rate uh, assuming 8 bit per sample? Okay, so, um, right, so we know that our N, 8 bit per sample, that means our N is equals to 8. All right, so to find our bit rate, we need to know N, we need to know our FS, which is our sampling rate. So what is sampling rate? And we, if we actually use the minimum sampling rate, that means uh, we follow the Nyquist uh, sampling theorem, that would be two times the maximum frequency in the human voice, right? Okay, what is the maximum frequency in the human voice? The human voice uh, frequency, all right, can be somewhere, can be anything between uh, zero or five hertz to the highest can be as high as uh, five kilohertz, all right, or even four kilohertz, depending on what is the maximum frequency you use, all right. So to solve this problem, you need to know what is the range of a human voice uh, frequency. So now, uh, let's say we take uh, 5 kilohertz, for example, the highest uh, human voice frequency in our um, signal that we want to transmit is 5 kilohertz. 
then your sampling frequency will be two times 5K, which is 10 kilohertz. All right. And this means uh, our sampling rate is 10,000 samples per second. All right. So always write your sampling frequency or your sampling rate in samples per second. Yeah. And uh, of course, I use 5K, which is quite high. So 5K is normally applicable for female voice. Female voice uh, has a higher frequency as compared to uh, male voice. Yeah. So that gives me a bit rate of 8 bit per sample. So for every sample, I need to, I'm going to represent it with 8 bits. All right. So I have uh, 10,000 sample in a second. So I have to multiply that with. Thank okay. you. All right. So that will give me 80 kilo bits per second. Right? Yeah. 80,000 bits per second. That's my bit rate. Okay. So uh, as far as this example is concerned, uh, you are free to use any um, the maximum frequency you can use 3k you can use 4k um, you can also use up to 5k all right so that is for bit rate so how do we bit relate bit rate to bandwidth have you got this down yes miss Do yes you? miss all right so um to relate Bit rate to bandwidth, all right, we need to understand a bit about uh, sampling theorem. All right, so as from sampling theorem, we actually learned that uh, if we have a signal of bandwidth B, all right, we have to sample the signal at uh, 2B samples per second. All right, so in a similar manner, if you have a data coming at a rate of 2B, Hertz. That means also 2B uh, samples per second. All right. So basically, that tells you that the original signal bandwidth is actually only B. All right. Okay. So that actually leads us to one basic relationship in communication that say uh, a maximum of 2B independent pieces of information per second can be transmitted error-free over a noiseless channel of bandwidth B hertz. All right, uh, to put it in a simple English, <laughs> all right, what it means is uh, I need one hertz to transmit two bits. All right. As far as bandwidth is concerned, I need one hertz bandwidth. This is bandwidth to transmit two bit data. All right, this is uh, put it in the simple words. Or uh, two bit data only need uh, one hertz bandwidth to transmit. All right. So that's how we end up with the uh, 2B data only need a, a bandwidth of B hertz. All right. Okay. And um, okay, let, me, let me show you how this is possible using a diagram. Let's say I have my bit data. All right. Let's say it's 1011. Uh, one, one. Okay. 1011. One, one. If I were to convert it to uh, Waveform, right? One zero one one is going to look like this, right? The pulse, right? This is one zero one one. Okay, let me right, properly. This is one. This is zero. This is one. This is one. <laughs> All right, and then. Uh, after power shaping you know, and so on, uh, I'm going to end up with something like this. All right. I'm going to end up something like this. Yeah. So if you look at this signal, 
Okay, what is one hertz? What is one hertz? <laughs> All right, one hertz basically is one oscillation, isn't it? Which is from, from here to here. This is one hertz. All right, one oscillation is one hertz. So in this one hertz, I can transmit two bit, which is one and zero. All right, so this is how the, this concept come about. But again, this is uh, this is true. This is only true, right? Uh, when you transmit your signal um, using this kind of line code, all right? One is represented by a rectangular wave, which lasts for the entire duration of this bit. And zero is transmitted uh, again using a pulse, all right, which is lasts for the entire duration of bit uh, zero. Okay, this is only true for this kind of light coding uh, use. Uh, later when I talk more about light coding, then you see that um, the bandwidth requirement will change, all right, following the type of uh, light coding method you use. Okay, so this gives us that the bandwidth, theoretically minimum bandwidth is basically uh, RB over 2, all right, where RB is actually your bit rate. Okay, I'm going to use RB a lot later on. So RB is meant for your bit rate. Yeah. So this is the theoretical minimum bandwidth. Okay. Okay, so uh, again, this slide talk a bit more about the transmission bandwidth. Um, so here we have uh, again n bits for each sample. So this n bit correspond to L levels. All right. So if we have our signal which is band limited to B hertz, all right, we actually sample at two B per second, right? Yeah. So again, uh, each sample consists of n bits. That means we must transmit uh, two n bits per second, two n b bits per second. Yeah, where b is the bandwidth of the, our uh, baseband signal or the analog signal. So because we can transmit uh, two bits per hertz of bandwidth, so the minimum bandwidth required to transmit is actually just the n times b. All right, or or n times b, what is b? b is actually the highest, the highest sampling frequency in your, um, yeah, the highest frequency in your uh, baseband signal, correct? b hertz. So b is actually the highest frequency in your baseband signal. And uh, in practice, we actually choose the transmission bandwidth. This is a bit higher than this one. All right, this is only for theoretical minimum bandwidth. Okay. Um, all right, let's look at one example. So um, we have a signal that is band limited to 3 kilohertz. We sample at the rate of uh, 33 and one third percent higher than the Nyquist rate. Maximum allowable error in the sample amplitude or the maximum quantization error is 0.5% of the peak amplitude VP. All right, assume binary encoding. Find the minimum bandwidth of the channel to transmit the encoded binary signal. Okay. So uh, I, believe, I believe the answer is in your lecture notes, right? I actually type data because there are a lot to write. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, okay. So I just go through it. Yeah. Um, now, to find the bandwidth, uh, you must first find the bit rate. All right. And uh, our bit rate is given by the n times fs. All right. This is our rb, yeah, bit rate. Um, so n is, again, to find the n, we must first find, uh, we find our n through the error the specification for the maximum quantization error. 
And what is FS? Uh, FS is actually given here is 33 and one third percent higher than the Nyquist rate. So if you find your Nyquist rate and you multiply by 1.33, uh, so that will give you your uh, sampling rate. Okay, your FS. Yeah. Nyquist rate is always two times, two times the highest frequency in the baseband signal. So the is three kilohertz. So that will give us a Nyquist rate of 6,000 6, hertz or six kilohertz. And this actually means 6,000 uh, samples per second. Uh, actually, it's 33.333% uh, 33 higher. So we multiply um, this Nyquist rate with 1.3333. That will give us uh, uh, 8,000 hertz. Uh, which mean uh, 8,000 samples per second. All right. Uh, did I write this? No, I didn't write. So let's divide it to, this is 8,000 samples per second. All right. And then um, to find N, to find N, uh, we need to make use of this information here, the maximum allowable error, which means the maximum quantization error. All right has to be um, 0.5% of the peak amplitude. All right, so from here, we actually uh, derive, yeah, mm, maximum error is actually plus minus delta V over two, right? Yeah, that is the maximum quantization error, delta V over two. So that means uh, delta V over two, uh, again, I have to, because I know my V peak, I, I need to uh, make sure it's 0.5% uh, of the peak amplitude. So um, I have to uh, convert convert the equation for delta V into VP. All right, delta V is basically VPP over L. So VPP is 2VP, so 2VP over L. So that means uh, my VP, okay, I, you cancel two and two, that give me VP over L, must be less than 0.5%, okay? 0.5%, you convert to decimal is 0 0.5 over 100. Okay, always write in this form, yeah? 0 0.5 over 100 times of peak amplitude VP. All right, so if I cancel VP and VP on these two sides of the equation, all right, uh, then I'll get my L must be greater than 200. All right, where does this 200 come from? This 200 is 100 over 0 0.5. Okay, these 200 come from 100 over 0 0.5. Huh? I bring L over here and my 100 will go over here, 0 0.5 will go down. And then my sign, my sign now need to change. So less than become greater than. All right, so these are simple maths. Huh? So I, <laughs> I, I don't think you need me to explain. Okay, um, then L is equal to two to the power of N, right? L is equal to two to the power of N unit. Um, okay, where am I? Okay, sorry, I must set this one wrong already. Okay, L is equal to 2 to the power of N. So uh, that means my 2 to the power of N must be greater than 200. Yeah, so that gives me my N must be greater than 7.64. All right, N must be greater than 7.64. So again, N must be a whole number. All right, N must be a whole number because N represents how many bits, right? You cannot have half a bit. You have you can only have one bit, two bit, or three bit, and so on, right? So n should be a whole number. So the minimum minimum value for n has to be eight, isn't it? Yeah. You can use nine, ten, and so on because the expression say n must be greater than seven point six four. But why we use eight instead of nine or ten or eleven? It's because we just want to know the minimum bandwidth. All right. Because if you actually use a bigger value for your n, your bandwidth will be bigger as well, All right? You have, have you need a wider bandwidth, but we just want to know the minimum bandwidth. So therefore, use the minimum value for your n, which is eight. All right. So using n equals to eight will give, guarantee you uh, have an error of less than zero point five percent. You don't use seven, uh, If you use seven, your error will be more than zero point five percent. All right. Okay, um, so now bit rate is actually a uh, number of bits um, per sample, number of bits per sample times your sampling rate. Yeah, the number of bits that we use, which is N times FS. All right, so that will give you, now we get everything. So put in the numbers. 
So n equals to eight, right? Fs is uh, 8,000. So that will give you a bit rate of 64 kilobits per second. All right, 64 kilobits per second. Now the bandwidth. All right, we have just learned that we can transmit two bits per hertz, right? Two bits per hertz. Therefore, the transmission, the minimum bandwidth is 32 kilohertz. Yeah. So for bandwidth, the unit of measurement is always in hertz. Uh, the bit rate is always in uh, bit per second. Yeah. Okay, then that's for part A. And then for part B, uh, we actually multiplex multiplex 24 similar signals together on a single line. So what is the minimum transmission bandwidth required? Okay, multiplex. So again, we talk about ideal multiplexing. So we just times 24. All right, times 24, that will give us the transmission rate of uh, 1536 kilobits per second. Again, for minimum, to find minimum bandwidth, you divide the bit rate by two. So they will give you 768 kilohertz bandwidth for uh, 24 signals that have been multiplexed together. Okay. Right, I have some similar question in the tutorial uh, sheets, so you may want to try and do them um, after the lecture. All right, that will definitely help you to understand and the concept better and also know how to go about it. Okay, Ken. Ken is. All right, can I move on? Okay, so uh, let's talk about line coding. All right, uh, what is line coding? To transmit uh, the digital signal, all right, the, or the PCM code word or the binary bits yeah, through physical medium. Remember, uh, the baseband digital information can only be transmitted through a uh, wired channel. Uh, so that is the physical medium we're talking about. So we need to convert the binary sequence into electrical waveform. All right, we need to convert into electrical waveform. So the process of uh, converting this binary information into electrical waveform is called line coding or transmission coding. Yeah. So um, because if you just convert the um, PCM into rectangular pulses as it is, then you end up uh, requiring a bandwidth which is infinite all right so any transmission that require infinite bandwidth is not it's not what we want all right because we always have limited bandwidth in our channel yeah so we actually have to perform uh, another process to actually limit the bandwidth of the line code yeah and this is called power shaping so i'm going to talk about power shaping uh, after line coding uh, but i put it here so that you're aware of the uh, entire process yeah so the diagram at the bottom of slide here actually show you again the process okay i have a message signal um i actually encode it so i've done my pcm now the next step i need to do is to perform uh, to do a line coding i have to convert this uh, bit stream you know one zero one one and so on into some uh, signals yeah some electrical waveform um, and then after this uh, electrical waveform, again, because this uh, line coding, normally it, the, the output will be a series of rectangular wave. All right, so we actually need to shape this. We need to shape this wave, all right, um, into a form that require less bandwidth, all right, because rectangular pulses require infinite bandwidth. And that's for pulse shaping, yeah. So let's talk about line coding here, this process, how to convert the binary bit stream into rectangular uh, pulses. Okay. All right, yeah, before going into it. <laughs> so what we need to use line code, all right, you may ask. 
um, again, because we convert it into waveform, all right, so we might as well make the waveform more suitable for transmission as well as uh, recovery, all right. So the first reason for using it is because uh, if we use a line code, it will actually enable us to synchronize the transmitter at the receiver. All right, and this this is only possible for certain types of line code. Uh, not all line codes uh, have this uh, self synchronization uh, property. And uh, certain line codes will allow an uh, error to be easily detected as well. All right, and and uh, even a better line code will give you uh, 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 error correction uh, property. Yeah. So um, what are good line codes? All right, a good line code should have a smaller or small transmission bandwidth. All right, we have seen a rectangular one cannot be used because the bandwidth is infinite. All right, and then it, a good line code should also give us um, good power efficiency. All right, so we need uh, as low power as possible. Yeah, and the line code, the next thing about line code is uh, it should be. Um, well immune to noise, right? And also immune to interference. Okay, this actually will give us the low probability of error at the receiver. Okay, we'll talk about low uh, probability of error uh, later in the next chapter, yeah? So uh, some light code allow uh, error to be detected and corrected. It has this capability, okay? And a good light code also should have uh, zero DC, yeah? A zero DC basically that will reduce the uh, heat dissipation along the line, and we also a good line code should have a bit synchronization uh, capability. All right, um, that means we can actually extract the timing signal from the line code itself. Okay, and uh, line code are normally used for direct direct communication between uh, CPU and peripherals, you know, like the internet cable. So you normally transmit, or again, as I mentioned, it's over uh, wired yeah, or cable uh, channel. Okay, and um, okay, let's talk about the different types of uh, line codes. All right, the first one on this slide is called a uh, on-off RZ. RZ stands for return to zero, All right? So for this type of line code, all right, a uh, binary information one, all right, is transmitted as a rectangular pulse, all right, for half of the duration of the bit, and the other half duration is a zero. Okay, so basically your one is represented by a uh, one cycle of a rectangular pulse. All right, followed by uh, half of it, and then I want I add certain amplitude, and the other half of the duration is at uh, zero amplitude. All right, that's for on off return to zero. All right, and this is uh, this is zero volt. Okay, and this is certain volt, let's say A. All right, that is to transmit a one. Uh, to transmit a zero, nothing. All right, zero volt. That is for on off. So on is to transmit a one. All right, but because it need to return to zero, so that means um, that the pulse only lasts for the half of duration of the bit, and then the other half of the duration, the amplitude will go to zero. Okay, that's what return to zero means. All right, the next type of line code is polar return to zero. All right, for polar return to zero. Polar means uh, the amplitude can be positive, can be negative. All right. So to transmit a one, to transmit a one, um, we use a positive amplitude A. All right. And because it's uh, return to zero, so therefore this amplitude only has R lasts for half the duration of the bit. All right. And then it goes down to zero. For the rest of the for the remaining half of the bit duration, yeah, that is to transmit a one, and to transmit a zero, a negative amplitude pulse is used. All right, to transmit a zero, the amplitude of the pulse is negative. 
All right, again, this lasts for only half a duration of the bit. And then uh, for the remaining half of the bit duration, the amplitude is zero. So that's what I meant by return to zero. Yeah. Uh, another type, which is called bipolar or uh, AMI, AMI stands for uh, alternate mark range inversion. Yeah, alternate mark inversion. So it's bipolar, and then this is for return to zero. So for this type of line code, okay, again, we use positive and negative amplitude, um, but the representation is now slightly different yeah, compared to polar. So in the bipolar, um, a one, okay, is trans the first one, the first binary one is transmitted with the positive amplitude for half of the bit duration and then go back to go down to zero. To transmit the second one, all right, if there's a one follow the, uh, the previous one, then the next one is actually transmitted at the negative amplitude pulse. Yeah, and this lasts for half of the bit duration and it goes back to zero. If we need to transmit another one again, then this one will be transmitted with the positive pulse. All right, for half of the bit duration and then go back to zero. And uh, in bipolar, zero is transmitted with no pulse. Okay, nothing. Yeah, that is for bipolar. Uh, the next type of line code is called on off and RZ. And RZ stands for non return to zero. All right, on off, non return to zero. So for on off, non return to zero, uh, again, same as the on off return to zero, we only use a positive uh, rectangular pulse to send our signal, yeah? But now because it doesn't need to return to zero, non-return to zero means it's not going to return to zero. So if you transmit a one, all right, you transmit with a positive pulse that lasts for the entire duration of the bit. All right, the second one will continue to last for the duration of the bit. The third one will be last for the entire duration of the bit. Yeah, and then for zero, we don't transmit anything. That's why it's called on off. On to trans on the pulse to transmit a one, off the pulse to transmit a zero. Yeah, and then the fifth type here, which is polar non return to zero. All right, polar non return zero actually it's the same as a polar uh, here return to zero, except that uh, the pulse does not return to zero. All right. So we're going to transmit now. Um, okay, to transmit a one, we transmit with a positive pulse that lasts for the entire duration of the bit. That's what the non return zero we mean here. Yeah. All right, and then for the second one, again, lasts for the entire duration of the bit. The third one lasts for the entire duration of a bit. But now to transmit zero, because it's polar, so we are going to transmit a negative pulse. Okay, negative pulse. That again asks for last for the entire duration of a bit because it's non return to zero. All right, so the, again, if we transmit the next zero, uh, that will be a negative again, uh, a pulse with negative amplitude that lasts for the entire bit duration. Okay, and then uh, the last type of line code on this slide is called the Manchester code. All right, so for Manchester code, um, a zero, a zero is transmitted with a low to high, uh, low to high transition. All right, so a zero is transmitted with the negative amplitude that lasts for half of the bit duration, and then the second half of the bit duration, uh, we we actually increase the amplitude to a positive. All right, negative go to positive. So low to high uh, transition. And then the transition happened at the mid, uh, during the mid time uh, the, for the bit duration. And then to transmit a one, right? To transmit a one uh, is high to low transition. So to transmit a high a one, we start with a high um, a positive pulse. All right, and this pulse go low to negative uh, during the uh, midpoint or the half bit duration and go to negative. So high to low is for uh, to transmit a one. 
low to high is to transmit a zero. Okay, that is for uh, Manchester code. Clear on line code. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually, the bipolar for the RZ one, I kind of, kind of confused about the waveform, because one, because the waveform is like one, uh, one up and one down like them, mm. that right. Mm. But I actually simulate this waveform with like the polar one. I found that actually it's kind of. Kind of not right. Uh, polar and the polar are not the same. Polar, ah, polar know, and the I polar know. are not the same. I know. I mean, I mean the the zero one is if I use the situation of polar, like like if God uh like got the got the waveform at the at the down down at the downside there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like actually, uh, like the, like actually the sine wave one. Uh, I found that I found that it's not actually like the sine sine wave like that. It's not a sine wave. It's a rectangular pulse. Yeah, rectangular pulse. Mm. Uh, so, um, mm, how to say ah. Uh, the uh ah the waveform is not actually the pattern we actually see like the the pattern is like one one up and one down right uh -huh. so actually i draw the waveform oh, i found that the pattern was not like the same one it crashed at the where you found the waveform like one, <laughs> huh? where you found your waveform uh, I don't know where you found your waveform, but uh, if you look at the polar and the bipolar, you will compare them. Yeah, um, for polar, for polar, zero are transmitted with a negative pulse, whereas bipolar, zero got no pulse. Okay, uh, zero is sent without any pulse. But for polar, uh, zeros are sent with negative pulse. All right. And then for polar, one is always sent with a positive pulse here. One is always sent with a positive pulse here. But for bipolar, the ones are sent with the alternate positive and negative pulses. All right. So the first one I send with positive pulse. The second one I'm going to send with negative pulse. And the first one I'm going to send with the next one because the previous one already sent with negative pulse. So the next one I send, I am going to send with a positive pulse. Oh, I can I can uh, understand the meaning. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. And then again, uh, after the zero, there's another one I need to send. Then I look back. Oh, the previous one I sent with a positive pulse. Right? Now this one I'm going to send with negative pulse. Okay. Yeah, understand better, I think, in this way. Okay, so actually you look at these few types of line code. Huh? Yeah, if you look at the on off, for example, on off, uh, the pulses are always are always positive. All right. You know what's the the that there are actually a reason where for certain line code why we actually send negative pulses. If you look at the on off, the line codes, uh, the pulses are always positive. All right, that means that uh, there will be some DC component here in the uh, resultant signal because they're always positive. All right, whereas for polar, all right, your DC component is less. Okay, uh, close to zero. All right, provided, provided the probability. Uh, okay, when we talk about digital data, we have to talk about probability. Really. So if you uh, use polar coding, if the probability of zeros and ones are the same, all right, 
So the negative pulses will actually uh, offset the positive pulses. And therefore, that gives you zero DC. Okay, This is only true when the probability of 1 and the probability of zeros are the same, which is 0 0.5. All right. If your data consists of more ones compared to zeros, then you have a bit of DC, which is positive. All right. If your data has more zeros as compared to one, then your DC level will be slightly negative. All right, that's for polar. Yeah. So the bipolar actually solve this problem by alternating the uh, one, sending one with a positive pulse and negative pulse. So this will ensure that I have zero DC component in the resultant signal. Okay, because after I send one positive power, I send one negative power to offset it. So zero level between these two signal is the DC level after sending these two pulses is zero. All right. And then for non-return to zero on off again, again, you're going to have some DC. Yeah, you're going to have some DC values because um, your pulse is always positive. All right. So your DC is, is always you have to have some DC component, which is always greater than zero. All right. Just now we say we don't want DC component, you know, because DC component is going to give us a problem. And uh, then for polar signal, yeah, for polar signaling non-return to zero, again, um, same thing. All right. Yeah, you will have zero DC component if the probability of zeros and ones uh, are the same, which is 0 0.5. Yeah. Um, then the next thing, if you compare, uh, okay, let's talk about Manchester code first. Manchester code, for every bit that we send, we make sure we have positive and negative amplitude. So this will bring our DC levels to zero. Okay, this is what we want. Yeah, this one Manchester code actually is quite, uh, sometimes some people use it uh, because it gives it give them this zero DC component. All right, every bit I send, I guarantee zero DC component, yeah, by sending positive and negative pulse. Okay, and then the next thing we want to see is, um, okay, we look at, let's look at uh, one, okay, let's look at uh, this one here. Let's look at the on-off, non-return to zero and on-off return to zero. Let's compare these two. If you look at uh, on off return to zero, all right, I send a bit one with uh, um, amplitude a pulse that lasts only for half of duration. The other half of the bit duration, the bit will go back to zero. So with this, I can actually extract the timing information from here. All right, high to low transition and then how long it lasts. Then I know uh, when uh, the timing information, I can synchronize at the receiver. Okay, so I can sample at the right time. Okay, I can set my sampling frequency and then I can uh, set my sampling time as well. So this is a good for having uh, on off uh, with, uh, or return to zero signal. All right, but if my signal does not return to zero, like in this case, um, there's no way I, I there's no way for the receiver to tell is this the bit duration for is this duration for one bit or is this the duration for three bits or four bits? All right, so I don't know what is the timing for uh, one bit. Yeah, so this will give us uh, some synchronization problem. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, in practice, in practice, uh, we actually can use a start bit. Okay. So for this series of for this this series of data, I actually add a start bit here at the beginning. All right. And then um, therefore for the last start bit again, then I know you know. So from here to here is the end of the uh, bit streams. So I know how many bits in there. Therefore, I can uh, get the uh, bit or the timing information from there. Okay, um, so another thing, another thing uh, that we can see by comparing the uh, return to zero and non to return to zero line code is that if you look at this, uh, if I transmit a one, okay, I transmit a one, basically I use one oscillation to transmit a one. All right, so this is already one cycle or one hertz, right? So that means to transmit one bit, I need one hertz of bandwidth. If I use a return to zero, ideally, lah, yeah. Uh, to, to transmit one bit here, I need one hertz bandwidth. Yeah, because this is one full oscillation already. 
But if I were to use non-return to zero, all right, non-return to zero, the biggest bandwidth, the widest bandwidth I need is here. From here to here. This is one oscillation. All right. So this is one hertz. So that means if I use a non to zero, uh, non return to zero uh, type of line code, right, I can transmit two bit with one hertz. All right. So for non return to zero, my bandwidth requirement is only half of the return to zero type of line code. Yeah. Of course, uh, I, I, I need less bandwidth, but then I have a problem of uh, bit information uh, because I don't have the transition, low to high transition that tell me uh, how long this bit is. Okay, But this problem is normally solved by using a start bit. Okay, so uh, actually I, I talk about this uh, on the next page of the slide here. Okay. Um, yeah, what else did I miss? All right, so return to zero. Okay, as you can see, return to zero uh, line code normally has a half width pulse. We call it half width pulse uh, because this pulse only lasts for the half duration of the bit. And then the return to uh, non return to zero line code, uh, normally I call it uh, full width pulse. All right, full width pulse. So this is a pulse that lasts for the entire duration of the bit. So for on off keying, uh, again, yeah, this, this expression means uh, I send a binary one with a pulse, but I send a binary zero with no pulse, All right? And uh, this method actually is simple, but it has DC component. There's a problem with this method. Uh, and it has uh, low noise immunity, all right? Low noise immunity, why? Because uh, I actually, I actually transmit the one with some amplitude, transmit the zero with no amplitude. So a uh, noise level, uh, if my amplitude is not big enough, so any noise, uh, let's say a zero, you can have a noise somewhere here. And this, this zero can be interpreted, um, wrongly interpreted at the receiver as a one. Okay, because uh, I use amplitude to represent. Yeah, and then the difference between zero and binary zero and binary one, the difference in amplitude is only A. All right, uh, I'll talk more about this when we go into the next chapter, we talk about the uh, error performance. Okay, so uh, okay, for return to zero problem, okay, so, um, for, so for, non, for return to zero, I told you, right, uh, because we have a uh, these pulse actually go back to zero in the middle of the bit duration, so we can extract timing information easily over here. But the problem comes when you actually transmit a series of zeros, continuous uh, strings of zeros. Then there is no uh, timing information in here. Really. That's, that's when the problem with the uh, on off, even though it's returned to zero. Okay, and then. Um, for non-return to zero, um, because data does not return zero in one clock interval, so we there's no way it's difficult for us to synchronize at the receiver. But normally we use a start bit. Okay, and then for polar, polar is uh, one is transmitted with a positive pulse, zero is transmitted with a negative pulse. Okay, this method is actually very simple as well. Um, Another thing is, uh, I forgot to mention here, is a zero DC component. All right, zero DC component. And uh, this method, okay, we're going to um, see again in more details later on. This method actually is more power efficient, the most power efficient method because it uh, requires the least power for a given error probability. All right, we'll look at this in uh, next chapter, I believe. But I'll show you, I think I'll show you later on. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, do I have it? Uh? I forgot really. Oh no, I don't have it. I think it will be in chapter seven. Okay, where I actually in chapter seven, I actually will evaluate evaluate the performance of uh, all the uh, digital um, communications system, and then we look at the one of the measurement we're going to look at is the probability of error. All right, probability of error meaning uh, how how likely you know how likely is the receiver uh, is going to make a mistake, yeah, in actually interpreting the incoming signal. 
And then that is for, but uh, polar, polar is found to be uh, the most power efficient because they need the least power uh, for a given uh, prob probability of error. And then for non-return to zero, same problem, same problem for on-off keying. Um, but then again, we can use a start bit to solve the problem. Okay, for bipolar, bipolar uh, uh, normally is uh, returned to, in this case, return to zero. We send a one uh, with the alternate uh, positive and negative pulse. We send a zero with zero uh, pulse. Yeah. And uh, this, for this bipolar, we can easily detect a bit error. Okay, because uh, you see, if we send a one with a positive pulse and then uh, let's say the receiver receive a positive pulse and next pulse it receive is also a positive pulse. That means the detect uh, the receiver know this it must be a mistake there already. Yeah, because for bipolar, um, the pulses has to be alternate between positive and negative. All right. If we have two positive pulses coming uh, one after another, that means there's an error. Yeah. So bipolar uh, line code allow a bit error to be easily detected. Uh, again, same problem when your data have a long strings of zero because we send zero with no pulses. Okay, and this method is commonly used in optical communication system and satellite and video recorder. So I actually put it over here. Okay, and Manchester code. Yeah, Manchester code basically again send a half width pulse. All right, one is sent as a high to low uh, pulse, where zero is sent as a low to high pulse. Again, the advantage of this Manchester code is a uh, zero DC component. All right, zero DC component. And then uh, synchronization also is easier. Okay, uh, it has no synchronization problem. Okay, so there is a brief comparison on the type of line codes. Okay, so what about bandwidth? Okay, so bandwidth, um, this slide show you the power spectral density of uh, different types of line code. And uh, we are actually using half width rectangular pulses. Huh? We haven't even done pulse shaping. Huh? We are actually looking at the uh, half width rectangular pulses. Um, so for bipolar, bipolar, the uh, bandwidth is equals to bit rate because if you look at the spectrum, this is the bandwidth for bipolar, and this is the RB. So your bandwidth is same as your bit rate. Uh, let me see. Uh, there's a note down here. Bandwidth. Uh, are more than the theoretical bandwidth of RB over two because we use half width pulse, return to zero pulse um, because we want uh, self clocking. Yeah. Oh, okay, this one got pulse shaping, sorry. Uh, we actually uh, use a pulse shaping filter with R equals to one. All right, that's why uh, our bandwidth is uh, RB. Okay, later I'm going to show you how the um, pulse shaping filter. Uh, it's going to change or affect the bandwidth requirement. All right. Um, so this is this slide just for comparison. Yeah. Uh, under the same situation, uh, we condition the signal uh, under the same condition. Then your bipolar line code is going to need a bandwidth of RB, which is same as your bit rate. Manchester code will need a bandwidth of two RB. This is your Manchester code PSD. So you need about about uh, near to 2RB. This is one Manchester code. All right, and then the polar and the on off keying with normalized power, we need a bandwidth of 2RB as well. So if you look at this one, this one is for the polar. You see that you actually need about close to uh, two times the bit rate, the bandwidth. All right. Okay. So that is for, uh, I think that's enough for today, uh, one o'clock already. Right, so um, do you have any questions before I end the class? No questions, no yeah. questions. So if you actually compare the few types of line code that we have here, uh, bipolar actually is the one that need the least uh, amount of bandwidth uh, as compared to uh, polar or 
on Octane or even Manchester code. Okay, in practice, which one you choose? Depend. All right, so this is where uh, you need to be able to evaluate and uh, make decision. Oops. Uh, miss, one question. Uh. Uh -huh. Yeah, Miss, uh, can I have a private conversation with you uh, later after What's the that? class? Bausan, Bausan here. Oh, okay. All right, so I actually see some question over here. Um, what if the number of one is odd? What do you mean, Jingwei? Or the bipolar number of one is odd, and uh, then you are going to have a little bit of TCO, right? The first one is positive, the next is negative, then the next one is positive again, <laughs> right? So you have more positive than negative, so you have a, a, a positive DC. Okay, uh, why we want to eliminate DC? Uh, yeah, uh, we, we cannot have DC component in our transmission system, you know, because uh, DC component is going to give you an issue uh, of, um, because your signal, DC component is not really your signal, isn't it? Right? Your signal is always AC. Right? As far as the real life signal is concerned, it's AC. It's not DC. So we have to remove DC from our signal. All right, and DC, DC component will also uh, cause a problem. You, uh, you actually heat up, you actually heat up our the transmission line. Okay, so that is for um, the reason. Communication system, we cannot have DC. DC component is going to mess up our signal. Okay, and any other questions? No, if not, then I'm going to end the class here, yeah? Okay, so uh, we meet again in our next class. All right, bye-bye, thank you.